Hello and welcome to the Zoom meeting, Evaluation of Speech New Considerations, uh, put on by the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. Today we're going to um, be going over some content that hopefully will help you um, improve and, um, and modify the um, evaluations that you're doing right now. Would like to thank the Wisconsin Statewide Parent Educator Initiative or WISPI for letting us use their Zoom platform so that we can hold our meeting in this manner today. In your, um, in your email for this event, I had sent you a, uh, a link to the participant folder. Um, it is also in your handout. And so uh, I encourage you to look at that. Um, but there are many relevant resources that we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, we are recording this session, and once we have it closed captioned, we will make sure to post it to the Wisconsin DPI speech and language website. I'd like to take a second and do a brief pause um, for a land acknowledgement. This is a visual representation of the Native Americans that um, were stewards of this land prior to colonialization. And since we're from all over the state, I encourage you to look at your um, area and what nation it is that is, is the steward of your area. So I'm in Madison, and so Ho-Chunk um, would be the um, Native American um, group of people that are stewards of this land. Okay, so... Um, what we're meeting here for today is um, the evidence-based practice and evaluation of speech. So we're going to talk about the research and the research update and how we can apply that into um, what we're doing in the schools, right? So we have IDEA, we have state law that we also need to um, adhere to. And so let's take this new research and then talk about how do we apply it. Um, and in addition, uh, we have some relevant and useful tools that um, if you aren't already using, um, that you can hopefully easily incorporate into what you're doing um, so that you can use other tools other than norm referenced assessments. So just a shout out to Marie Ireland once again as a thanks for sharing all of her materials and resources as well as making the video um, free on YouTube. Um, there's one piece that is different and we just wanted to note that, is that uh, she talks about SLP's role in multi-level system of support or providing services um, outside of um, special education. And in Wisconsin, we are not able to engage in those kinds of activities. Um, we can work directly with teachers. We can send home packets. We can provide services in classrooms if there are children with IEPs in the classroom and other students may attend um, and that's considered incidental benefit. Um, but it is different than what she talked about in her video. So I just wanted to make that clarification for uh, Wisconsin. Okay, so the research. Uh, so those of you who have heard me speak um, over the last couple of years know that in 2018, McLeod and Crow put out um, a, a review of um, of studies that were done that looked at across 27 languages, what was the age of acquisition, age of acquisition for speech sounds? And they found that, you know, 90% of kids um, mastered 93% of sounds by age five. And they had these really pretty infographics and everyone started freaking out, right? Um, Marie Ireland swept in right away and um, said, wait a minute, this isn't um, how, this is just the norm development. This doesn't have anything to do with eligibility in schools. So we need to pause. Um, so if you've heard me speak about this before, you also know that I talk about the informed SLP article, uh, that one time a journal article on speech sound norms blew up the internet. And that was also in 2018. And Marie Ireland also um, had a response in there that was basically what I just said, like, hey, hold on, you still have to show evidence of um, educational impact or social emotional impact. Um, it's not just um, documenting that there's a delay in speech sound acquisition. So she ended up working with, with Crow and McLeod 
um, to do a study of just American English um, studies. So they're not actually doing new research on kids. What they're doing is they're reviewing all of the research on kids around speech sound ap uh, acquisition. And so this time for the 2020 article, they reviewed English U.S. only studies. And that was 15 studies. Uh, it was 18,907 children. And what they found was a about the same, right? Most kids um, acquired most sounds by age five. Now, I think it's important to note that that five is actually five years, 11 months, um, which I think makes things just a little bit different. Um, there's an, uh, there are a couple of other interesting points uh, that when they reviewed articles, there were not, there was variability and most studies that they reviewed um, did not break out by gender, by boys and girls, and they didn't um, analyze consonant cluster acquisition, which we're used to looking at because of the Smit et al. norms. Um, and that's because most languages don't have consonant clusters like English does, um, and, and not all studies looked at that. And so that's why it wasn't a part of um, the findings in their compilation. So this study looked at 90% mastery at the sound level for sound for, for the sounds. And I think one thing that we need to really um, take note, and this is what um, Marie Ireland in her 2020 article that just came out too about applying this research to um, providing services in, in the US schools. Um, what she points out is that these norms were not established for diagnostic purposes. They were, they were um, done to look at the range of, of um, sound acquisition. Um, and that's different than saying, is this child disordered or not? Right, so I think that's something that we do have to keep in mind when we're looking at using these norms. They were not designed to determine difference uh, or disorder versus normal speech. What they are is they're just showing the developmental progression and that there's a range of um, developmental progression um, and you can see that in their work. So I did include links. These are the pretty infographics. They did, these are the US specific ones. Um, and so then you can see this visual here of 90% um, of criterion. They also have the space version. And so what you're gonna do is you are going to, um, we're gonna break into breakout rooms. If you choose to do this work independently, just don't join the, work, the breakout room that we put you in. Um, I'm gonna have you look at, um, someone can share their screen and pull up um, the Crow and McLeod, one of these norms um, that we were looking at and map it on to the Smith et al hard copy that you have. What we're going to be doing is looking at um, what questions does this bring up for you? What changes seem most pronounced and how is this going to you know, affect your work? Uh, keeping in mind that this is one you know, tool in the toolbox or one piece of information. Well, I ended up marking mine up quite a bit. Is the example of five meaning 511 the same pattern? Um, so I did, when I go into the research and I look at the research, what I saw was, yes, that it, the range is 20 to 211, 30 to 311, 40 to 411. Um, five zero to five eleven, and if you if you go in more, you know the the Crow, Crow and McLeod twenty twenty article a little and look at more details. You know there some sounds obviously have a greater range than others. Um, R and S show the greatest variability of mastery with more of a twenty month range. So um, I encourage you to look at that study. Discrepancies are greater for middle and later developing sound groups. Discussed how Smith has S, Z, and N, G as the final developing sound, while Crow and McLeod talk about R and TH. Change for R was um, significant. Um, one thing I did want to note too, um, you know, Schreiberg and Kwiatkowski, um, UW-Madison, greats, um, they had something called um, the early seven, the middle seven, and the late seven or something like that. And um, the Crow and McLeod found that it's more like early 13, middle seven, late four. 
So there's a little bit of a, of a shift here too. Is 90% at isolation or word level? It was at the word level that all the studies um, elicited the sounds at the word level. There was discussion how this will make conversations about effect on education much more important. Um, should have been important already. I would just raise that, that up. Um, curious about proposed changes in speech language criteria and how this will blend with the new norms. You know, no specific norms were called out in the criteria, criteria in, t in the administrative rule currently. And so, um, and, it, and those are not spelled out in the new rule either. Um, that's gonna be part of guidance. So it'll be part of a new um, set of guidance documents. Concern for the limited RTI options of for our TIC in Wisconsin. You know, yeah, there's a lot of variability of what happens across the United States. And so um, I'm actually part of a group right now that's looking at that. Um, what can SLPs do um, around multi-level systems of support um, across, you know, across different states? So um, stay tuned with about that. Um, I do think it's um, something that warrants further discussion, too. Why wasn't word position considered in the McLeod study? You know, I think, I think when you look at, and, and I do encourage you to go back and look at the article, I find them pretty easy research articles to read. Um, and, and I'll, during our next break, go back and look at this again. But what they did is they looked at such a large number of studies um, and really Smith et al. was unique in the way that they um, looked at things and broke them down so much. So most studies don't do that when they report their findings. And so that's why things like gender weren't reported reported in the, the Crow and McLeod findings and why consonant clusters were not as well. So um, I don't know if they said anything specific about word position, but I, at least I can go back and look at that too. Talk about was, the, go ahead. There was a comment about, um, uh, is it going to be up to speech language pathologists to educate staff about the documentation part for educational and social and emotional impact uh, this is Daniel Parker. One of the things we're trying to do with all of our rules and with upcoming guidance on just conducting a special education evaluation is that all special education evaluations should be looking at educational um, impact and the academic and functional needs of students and how that impacts access, engagement, and progress in general education curriculum. Um, so, so we will be emphasizing that across rules, and I would say that's kind of everyone's responsibility. Um, certainly, we also want to me message that to LEA reps, uh, but I think speech and language pathologists certainly should be having conversations with their, um, with their administrators and other educator teams uh, to really make sure people understand why special education is there. Um, versus a cl more clinical model. Um, there's a question. Can you talk about norms not being used to determine a disorder, but the but the uh, sound has a sound error when 90% of typically developing children, it's part of the criteria. Um, I'm just telling you that's the purpose of doing the studies was not in looking at um, disordered versus normal development speech. I, the purpose of those studies was to look at how students acquire or kids acquire sounds. Um, and so it was just, that's the purpose of the studies. And so, and that's different than how we're using the norms. And so I'm not saying we can't, um, it's part of our criteria um, but let's, you know, let's make sure that it's one piece of information and not the piece of information. There will be a new um, guidance. Um, there will be some new guidance resources. I mean, we're recording this um, presentation so that people can access it and review. Um, there's materials that have go are going along with this to give people more ideas. So um, yes, we're providing support. Um, and as far as um, there was a question about educating insurance companies um, regarding these guidelines, um, 
Danielle, that's not, you know, we're an educational agency. We look at criteria um, for impairments for um, school-based service. Um, I think that might be something we could talk about at a future date, um, but not sure um, what we could say to insurance companies. I think that the way DPI can help, uh, this is Daniel, is if, you know, we have guidance documents around some of these pieces, that's something we can consider and, and schools can then just um, share those guidance documents with those companies or with the parents so that they, they understand. Um, and so the, one more question and then we'll go on. Um, are we, am I suggesting we toss Smith at all charts? If yes, um, by what date do we switch to the new charts? Well, it's just like when anything new um, comes out, like when the self four is replaced by the self five, um, you know, within a reasonable time frame, we do recommend, you know, that you use what is new and not what is outdated. And so this would be the same. And so um, this is not, you know, these, these norms have been out for a while now, at least, you know, last several months. And so it would be appropriate to consider using them, you know, now. And um, just knowing that it is a more comprehensive look at um, speech development in English for uh, in the U.S.